Hey everybody, um, welcome to Segway. Just to go over some uh, stuff at the top, um, we're going to be broadcasting in webinar format. So that means that um, attendees of this event um, will just be watching and won't be seen on screen. But everybody has access to the uh, chat feature. So if you feel like interacting with uh, the hosts or the readers using um, chat, please feel free to do so throughout the event. Um, we're going to open with Zach Haber. And once they read, we're going to have a brief intermission. And then uh, Juby Ariola Headley is going to uh, uh, read and then um, at that point, we'll be able to sort of integrate the audience into the, the panel. So at the very end, we'll hold for applause until the very end, which, sorry, Zach, that I know it's kind of weird. Um, I'll applaud for you. Um, and then everybody can applaud at the end for both readers. Um, and if anybody has any questions uh, in the audience, uh, go ahead and ask them now in the chat. Um, I see a raised hand. I don't know. If, uh, <laughs> if, if you have a question, uh, Philip, you can, you can enter it in the chat box. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So um, I'm going to throw things over to my partner and co-host, Ven Daniel. Hi. Hi, 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 hey, hello, thank you, everybody who's in the virtual room who I can't see, and thank you too for coming and sharing your work, and um, yeah, I'm going to introduce Zach, and then we'll read, and then we'll break for an intermission. Um, so Zach Haber is a poet, journalist, and activist. Their poetry and a lot of their other language-based work expresses an open engagement with and devotion to the places and people around them. For Zach's project, Horrible Places, they visited municipal buildings, registration offices, fast food chains, tech giant consumer outlets, police departments, national borders, hotels, candy stores, strip clubs, and many other places in 10 different states across the U.S. and wrote poems in each place. The work as a whole is a tender observational compendium of sense architecture. It is a resistance practice against capital's reduction of engagement in space between people inside of oneself and elsewhere to a utilitarian exchange with the goal of consumption. It's su super tender, it's matter of fact, it's simple. I remember reading parts of it and thinking, oh, this reminds me of Joe Brainerd, or like, oh, this kind of reminds me of uh, if uh, Parek were to exhaust a place, but it were to be like a social media post, length of attention instead of an entire book. Um, uh, Zach's writing reminds me of and embodies, first of all, before I read the book and then after uh, and reading other essays or, uh, or the project, I mean, uh, uh, essays and uh, uh, pieces online. Um, I was reminded of Pasolini's belief uh, that the life and poetry of the poet uh, inseparably merge in sort of that like the poet's duty is uh, to be uh, like a civic poet or civically engaged. And I, I, uh, I felt like all of that poetry was very um, compassionately attached to wherever it was written. Um, in a really beautiful, um, caring way. Uh, so, Zach Haber is an organizer of poetics and a journalist. Uh, 
the, all of their work can be found on Data Bleed, Zine, um, The Calafino Review, 580 Split, The Elephant, Teen Vogue, Sierra Nevada Review, and other places. They write about homelessness, police, misconduct, and education for the Oakland Post. Uh, they posted poetry readings and performances through the other fabulous reading series and other projects in the Bay Area since 2012. And they live in West Oakland. Please, everybody, welcome Zach Kidder. Ooh, okay, I'm imagining applause. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Ben, um, yeah, I do want to say um, that was. That was really, really sweet. Thank you so much. I used to host a reading series and I've attempted to do things like that in the past and like given up. <laughs> Honestly, I know it's it's hard to do and it's it means a lot. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, but yeah, um, so yeah, I'm gonna start out now. Um, unfortunately, um, Cassandra Smith passed away um, on Tuesday far too soon and she um, was a, uh, um, a really great poet and a book designer and just a really kind person who meant a lot to people who live here I mean, in Oakland and, and elsewhere, I'm sure, as well. Um, so I thought it would be good to read. Um, I'm just going to read the first page from her only book called You and I, and then I'll start reading my work. <sighs> With which memories do you feel most often afraid? You and I didn't often feel afraid. This was a constant in the unnatural order of how things are placed. You and I would set a book down to know it wouldn't move until someone meant to read it or dust beneath. The same with jars and windows and houses. These things did not move unless intentionally and intention in regards to movement was a natural process of the imaginary. This pleased you and I best, the movement of dancing each foot would be set upon the floor in certain ways one did not know the answer to. And there would always be an organic response that one would attend. Sometimes small trees would grow from the wood floors. Also, this was ordinary and you and I would not worry about the stains of water upon the carpets because carpets could always be taken into the yard and thoroughly washed. Okay. Um, I'm going to read two very short poems that I've written recently. Um, and why not? I think I'll show them to you as well. Oh, never mind, I can't, but that's fine. <laughs> Those in power over. Hero is what they call you when they're cool with crucifying you. If Jesus didn't make the cross, who did and why did they make it? I do not think they were one of those in power over. And this is called man's law. Heart vomit heart, man's law killed Jesus. Heart choke heart crisis isn't so pointed. Always whose heart hurts, why it's hard to stay in me, vomit. Whose heart hurts man's laws, crisis one. Um, yes, uh, and now I'm gonna read a bunch of poems um, from the project that uh, Ben told you all a little bit about, about horrible places. Um, San Francisco Zoo. Mommy, thank you for the ice cream. I think the animals are very sad. You think so? Well, they're rescued. They should be grateful to be here. They're being taken care of. I think they're sad. Denver Greyhound Bus Station. Are y'all okay, screams a woman to the bathroom. Are y'all okay, like, come on, what is this? Shirtless man wrestles with the knots in his hair in the mirror. He looks serious like he's trying to intimidate the knots with his mean mug. In the bathroom, there's no hot or cold water options, just one spigot with a button. When I press it, it wiggles, it's barely attached. Smells so much like chlorine and piss here, I taste it. Rotten, greasy duct tape covers up wall holes. Guy here visiting from Mexico says, the bathrooms are so sad, like, like, uh, this is really bad, but you know what? I won't cry because this is not my problem. This is the government's problem. And if they can't fix it, they'll have no clients, no clients, no food. Then how will you survive? 
Middle-aged man with four-pack sprinkled donuts and multiple head accessories, backwards cap, red bandana, green shades, sucks long and deep from a two-liter bottle of Pepsi, talks quick, pulsating, talk full of breath, itches arms sporadically, ferociously. The clothes he wears are clothes that people much younger than him would wear. Guy wears a bright white belt with the word fuck in large gold letters on the buckle. Guy quick walks around screaming in his cell phone, wearing an undershirt with brown stains on it. Where the fuck she went? Where the fuck she went? There's a child wailing like a siren, but with sandpaper in it. I can't even find this fucking woman. People's necks look exhausted. I'm going there and she might not even be there. Necks pulling bags up. She's so shady. Bags pulling necks down. She might not even be there stretching and straining. She might just be messaging me. People here today seem solemn and serious, like riding the bus is a sacred, terrifying duty. But I have to go there. They look like they're tired of having faces. It's not going to kill me. They look like their cheek muscles are tired of holding up their faces and their chins and foreheads are exhausted. That be the devil, says a man who points a curled finger at me, smiles mysterious puddle with broken glass and scrunching up soaking wet paper towels in it like someone tried to clean it up but got distracted. There's benches sparsely populated here with tired people who can't lay down and Greyhound tortures these people. Metal beams bracket up the benches into sections so people can sit but not lay and Greyhound could take these beams away but they don't. Um, Whole Foods. Oakland. It's so damn cold. I hate the cold. I'm feeling like raw, organic, boneless, skinless chicken breast is pressing against my skin. It's so fucked up they play the Smiths in the meat section. Light shines on the floor of the products. I can't not see the bright white lights. They're white like me. A sign over some produce says, Improving lives with every purchase. There is no subject in that statement. I guess it's implied. It's my parents. Do they help people with their cash, credit, money? Cold things have an extra light on them. Lights and wires hang down from the ceiling. Try something pumpkin. A woman asks an employee where the sparkling non-alcoholic ciders are. He shows her. She sees it. Then he won't stop talking to her about sodas and ciders. It's okay. No, that's fine. I can find what I need now. It's fine. It's okay. It's fine, I think she says. I think she's pretty. I blend in here well. I'm thinking about Steve stealing two slices of vegan pizza since I'm a revolutionary. Guy arranging lemons has got a meticulous haircut and super round glasses. He looks like a librarian. When I step back from the rows of products, they look a bit like confetti. This is a party. The cats on the cat food containers look solemn and wise. I hear and see what I assume to be a teenage daughter and her mother walking and arguing fiercely but casually like it happens all the time. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. And the tone reminds me of me and my mom when we were maybe their ages and mom slammed on the brakes, started sobbing and telling me the way I talked to her made her feel so terrible. I can't remember exactly what she said. Some people here look fantastic and frantic. A tall, strong, red-headed woman moves with urgency like she has to go to the bathroom but can't done till she go till she's done shopping. A baby is screaming. They're telling the truth. We satisfy, delight, and nourish our customers. With great courage, integrity, and love, we embrace our responsibility to co-create a world where each of us, our communities, and our planet can flourish, all while celebrating the sheer love and joy of food. Whole Foods used to use prison labor to process some of its trout, tilapia, and goat cheeses. They stopped this in uh, April 2016 after protests in September 2015. Since I'm a revolutionary, I did end up stealing two slices of vegan pizza. I even ate them in the store. And in this store in September 2015, a security guard whose name was not released beat up a black man whose name was not released and left him in a puddle of blood riding off to the emergency room. The security guard was fired since Whole Foods stands against violence. As I sit inside Whole Foods eating stolen vegan pizza, I am happy that they stand against violence. Um, so one more thing that I think I forgot to say that might be good for some context is that these were all written before COVID was a thing. <laughs> um, courthouse in Oakland. I have to walk through this metal detector before I step inside this building where some folks decide whether or not to kidnap some people. Why do people dress up all nice? Why do people dress up all fancy to decide whether or not to kidnap people? A guy here sells corn chips, but you have to eat the corn chips in the lobby. You can't eat the corn chips inside one of the rooms where people decide whether or not to kidnap people. You have to stand in line to pay the ticket. The pale judge sits up high above everyone. She seems tired from her anger. 
Her thoughts fill the room. She looks down on everyone. The only colors here are burgundy, brown, white, and black. There is no purple, no pink, no magenta. Sir, sit down. Sir, please remain seated. Max, can you instruct him as to where he should put his mouth? Your Honor, no. If I could just speculate, I don't take speculation. And you know what? If I ask for something specific, I only want to see the report. I don't want the whole pile of things that may or may not be related. I have liver cancer. That's irrelevant. I'm just trying to explain why I have the dogs. Sir, I want you to promise me this. I want you to promise me you'll get those dogs fixed. Will you promise me that? There's enough German shepherds in this town already. Starbucks, Oakland. Neck pain, long, long, strain, strain, neck pain, neck pain, neck pain, strain, strain, neck pain, long, 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 strain, strain, neck pain, neck pain, neck pain, strain, strain, neck pain. Smooth nonstop movement like cogs in a machine but made of people fizzes over and over and beeps and beeps and beeps neck pain. I count 49 different lights in this room, two security cameras and squeaky hard, loud, tall steel stool chairs. People keep almost walking into each other. No one's running. Almost everyone walks quick, stares, doesn't blink much, but then head and eye quick jerking, tilting up awake again, again. So turn this coffee into a livelihood. By purchasing this coffee, you help strengthen a farming community for years to come. Gentle metal bounce against the sink over breathy, sexy music. Mine was already ready when I came in, so I'm not sure why they didn't just make yours at the same time. I don't understand why this has to be like this. I'm Anthony. I order the same thing every day. Okay, what do you want in your espresso cup then? What do you want? What size? Awesome. Thank you. Are you doing your usual? Are you having anything to eat? Awesome. Thank you. My back feels like it has a stomach ache in it. Sir, what are we getting for you? Guys, what are we getting for you? Gentlemen, what are we getting for you? Missed, what are we getting for you? My back feels sick. Person keeps... Uh, uh, eats an ice cream cheese tortilla thing. Not an ice cream tortilla thing, sorry. Person eats a cream cheese egg tortilla thing slowly like he spites it, thinks he's better than it, slowly tearing it apart like a bird. Then he stares off like he spites what's off, but also with a practical wonder, like if he looks off enough, something will be found, but then suddenly pushes his chair in and leaves like, no, actually that is not true. Um, Baltimore, Washington, International Airport, which is in Baltimore. Shoes, computers, remove them. Shoes, computers, remove them. Shoes, computers, remove them. Shoes, computers, remove them. Security chants over and over, feeling pressure to move forward in the line, even though there's little space in front of me to move into. I see parents with long legs maybe walk a little too quick. Their daughter with short legs had to run to keep up. It's hard to tell whether daughter wanted to run, whether daughter even considered what she wanted. I feel like shit. I feel like the marrow in my bones has been replaced with shit. Last night I fell asleep after three since I was worried I wouldn't get enough sleep. I didn't get enough sleep. I feel sloth-like, but very unromantic. I feel like I'm dragging me. Dad said, let's not go through this crap again as he hugged me by then he kissed me. The flight left at one, but we got to get there two hours early. So we left at nine, even though it was only an hour drive. We gave us two hours in case of traffic, but there was no traffic. Firm square American flags placed in an equal distance from each other. Pentatonic scale, smooth jazz like music, music that sounds like plastic. I'm thirsty. It hurts me to carry my bags all the way to the fountain, but the airport tells me if I leave them unattended, someone's likely to put a bomb inside them. Security man says, now I'm just going to rub the back of my hands on your buttocks. I said, fine, but what if I'd said no? Could I still get on the plane? Or is it required that someone touch my buttocks? And what if he'd said butt instead of buttocks? Would that have been bad? And what if he said ass? <laughs> Feeling trapped inside my thick sleeping bag as jacket. I can't take it off. There's nowhere to put it. Sweat pushes into the jacket, then rubs back on my skin. A little cool and itchy. As I reach into my pocket for my wallet for ID, I feel a pressure and a drop within my chest into my stomach as I know if I don't have it, I'm fucked. But no, it's there. I found it. Then when a man loves a woman, the smooth jazz version, and this is how the airport tries to sex, he gets interrupted by security announcement with thick voice. Um, okay, so something new now, or different, old. <laughs> new in the context of this reading, but I wrote it in 2017, maybe. Um, it's a, a long excerpt from a book I wrote called, or, or from a poem I, I wrote called, um, What Jets Out From Horizon. I can't fit inside my body. Me, you sleep at the bottom of sea. There's a hole in morning. 
if buildings showed the pain of their creation, what would they look like? Like an ice pole pressed into my solar plexus. What is rotted still grows, and so the buildings do show. How everything is cracked when you look up close. Smudged into nightmare, nuts and bolts choke. Birds were swimming in the grass in the park, and the dark soft light in the ground is breathing. Pitiful hire, cries of plastic. Plastic heart brings Lego dream, which is always a nightmare, festering with internal bleeding. What becomes of a secret that dies? Drizzle eyes, scream of fog, dripping blanked out body, seeping in through the cracks and the law. There's a face sneaking through, a face peeking through. There will be no earth, there will be a sea of sound. I stand on scattered, fragmented reflections. Tree thinks through with me, you thinking. Sea overtook us long ago. Waves crash in the forest background, pushes through my pores, like how the suit I wear wears me, that there's an edge of me that doesn't have an edge still present, how the fleeting is present. There's a rainbow that drowns. I cannot embrace the ground, although I lay me on my stomach in the dirt, I cannot wrap my arms around. There are vines all over the trees. Sorry, there are veins all over the trees. There are vines all over the veins. How heavy are the clothes that overtake? I try to look back at me. Me, you glued by space, how my face cannot face my face. The sky falls down, what juts out from horizon. We can't fit inside horizon. Pencil body, flora blowing, colors dappling, surface fauna shatters, borders break to pieces, if just for a moment. Where's the road of water go? I barely hold on to my hand, it flies away. The faintest face, the black behind it all, the bloom after the stretch. There is a crack in every face scratched all over the surface, how to unruff, how to soften the face, and how the eyes fall into holes, and how the darkness cutting into, peeling back, shedding to create, ripping pieces off to make a new roots of my face, and how much nominon surrounds around us, sitting in the bottom of the sea and looking down, how the round sheds everything off that tries to land on it. The inexpressibility that constitutes and constipates the face, the hiding wind, I cannot reach my arm nor tear my hands off crosses to get down and how my heart is slightly pinched, the wind that blows it in my mouth, it strains my face, the waves crash inside me. There's how many bodies in my body, flowers peek through me. We cannot till the eyes, sometimes they're too solid to trust. What a face can do that a hand can't grant me patience, feral paint will flood the castle, it explodes to further lack of dominant perspective, veins kaleidoscope and limb buildings and cars drive through hearts raw, rotting like a band-aid tears off a busted, bursted MRSA abscess, drizzle blood rust, rust blood. Hard not to let legs disagree with arms hang on, parts of the city bash against each other perpetually. Pride shouldn't be symmetrical. Swirl faces the flower veins or the faces of rust and dust. We cannot go to the city, for the city will bring us the chains, but we must soften and blur the block body. Dust shine on the scattered landscape, slow paint confetti, violence of a perfect circle's borders accentuated by plastic anger as a glazed three-piece suit joined in a solemn parade. What we step over, I hide behind me. How symmetry can violence. Faces of coral increases and sky curling up all warm in the veil that is the cloud on the edges of the always brimming forest breath on the fuzz on the edges of the holes in me. What we see through holes and veils is not the same as what we'd see if there were no veils. And on the edges of the apertures lining a rusted silver lining that glitters still still the illusion of stillness that ripples my veins increases waters like the ghost trees in the sea. sea gasps that won't let go and keep gasping pressure from within that pushes outward on my skin that curves back two rips pressed together how at least one edge presses outward outlines all around terrifying joy of kaleidoscope hammer knocks down with colors not a plastic screen graves made earth dead press in bloom bodies Waves of skin, the pupils overflowing, coral iris, belly pulled up by the sky, revolt of what's been left behind, the dripping refuse rises up again like zombie angel crater body pain, which can't be gripped to calm the tension of the face, it can't, its borders press and scrunch it in like flowers, petals, edges, fray will curl in as it rots, refreshing river, cruelly sick, face slightly scrunched from river's ill misery party, refuse deluge, but there's otters up in Temescal Lake, no folks know why they're there or how they got there. Water stretches what's left on the shore, shine in the swirling colors of rot. Face can't not send messages. You hold your corpse inside you. Utopia is chaotic. What bleeds light? No rest and refuse. How'd my body get caught in my body? What's that question? Assume I fade in out if it's a not so still life. What's become of last year's snow and the trampled flowers that feed the next body stuff full of body? Ha! 
those gazes of deer that jump away forever, your face twisted up with other faces, seeing only what the light shows. Ha, what's the light show? Ha, you're standing on something that's falling. Ha. Restless eyes that won't stop jumping, edges are erupting, sky falls down, swimming in flowers, feral face a, can't, can't, a hand can't hold these dripping edges, no, the heart will never drip inside of bodies, borders blur more closer, your edges overlap so much, we're never sure which edge goes with which figure, torn together body, no lines make the sky, fog never captures, just a sliver of recognition, a rainbow spitting ever incomplete body. Okay. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, I'm going to read more of the Horrible Places poems now. Um, this one is um, about the Oakland Police Department. She sliced me up. I'm sorry, we can't talk about that right now. You will have to come back here tomorrow. Stuffed animals rest behind bulletproof glass on the cop's desk. Heavy doors screech and scream when they are closed slowly. A tiny terrifying explosion when the door hits the door frame and reverberates throughout this cold metal room. All the folks I see here seem out of breath. A homeless woman set up a tent in front of the building. A little girl walks in and looks at me suspicious, but I cock my head up like I'm saying what's up and she relaxes, sits down on the floor in the middle of the station and plays with the doll while the person she came in with, I'm assuming it's her mom, talks to a cop. She sliced me up. I'm sorry, we can't talk about that right now. A picture hangs on the wall of five cops smiling. Oh, how their smiles look confused, unfinished, and constipated. Below that picture is another picture of a cop holding a tiny yellow dog, and though she's smiling, she also looks devastated. Her smile looks like a migraine. And there's a few shots of cops with kids, and the cops got big four smiles, but the kids look confused, maybe mildly amused. The lights above me here are both dim and silver, evenly spaced from each other. For privacy and accuracy, please stand behind the line and wait to be called. I copy down into my notebook, but after I walk away from that sign, I wonder if I've written all the words down accurately. So I think to go back to double check, but then I remember I'm almost certainly being recorded. Is double checking on that sign suspicious? Could doing that get me into trouble? Is just walking around writing in my notebook suspicious? One thing that's not suspicious, for me to do is to go to the bathroom. And so I go to the bathroom. I feel like I can feel most comfortable in this police station if I am in the bathroom stall, sitting on the toilet, writing poetry in my notebook while pretending to poop. All right, I don't think I've read this one yet. This is gonna be fun. <laughs> um, 9-11 Tribute Museum. Um, Woman working the ticket counter says, okay, $15, or are you a student? No, I almost say quick, then interrupt myself and say, yeah, drown out slow. I like to read a lot, so I guess I'm a student. Without missing a beat, she says, okay, you're a student, $10 then. I pass through the gift shop where they've got a row of sad looking small stuffed dogs who wear shirts that read the 9-11 Tribute Museum. Then I step into the main room that feels like a low key war zone as I hear 9-11 footage, news broadcasts, radio announcements overlapping, interrupting each other. Fluorescent dull white light touches everything here since the windows are covered up. Air condition hums loud and it's so cold it hurts my nostrils. A picture of a dirty torn up American flag rests behind glass like that's supposed to be sad. A woman with a Gucci bag scrunches her face in disgust. The people wide eyed watching the 9-11 attack video mostly walk away after a few seconds, but the museum guard parks himself in front of the TV and watches the broadcast loop over and over as he bathes in the blue light. A section called A Nation Changed has a picture of a long line of frustrated people waiting at an airport to get through the TSA, but I fear TSA more than terrorists. Section called Who Did This doesn't mention Iraq or Saddam Hussein or the United States, but instead says it was Osama bin Laden who built over the course of a decade a dynamic and lethal organization using cultural and religious allusions to the Holy Quran and some of its interpreters. Section in the back is an area where people took notes and wrote little messages or drew little drawings on them in honor of 9-11, then attached them to the remembrance wall for all to see. One person drew stick figures that show rich people and poor people, fat, skinny people, straight, gay people, black, white people, disabled, abled people, when they wrote the words, we are all human on top, as if that, that were a good thing. Another person drew a picture of the Twin Towers and wrote, never forget, love from India. A person who signed his name Paul made the most memorable note card. On it, he wrote, 
I feel that the people who crashed into the center are bitches. I hope in the future this will not happen again. Um, I feel kind of weird that I said it would be fun to read that poem because it's a really fucked up poem. And I imagine since Segway is based in New York, some people might have had connections to 9-11. So I, that's not a fun poem. I'm sorry for saying that. Um, the National Zoo, Washington, DC. Kids, kids on leashes, kids on leashes who aren't watching where they're going. You're not watching where you're going, screamed a woman at her child. Smells like sweat in the gift shop. So many bodies, most with just a little sweat, yet it adds up. A man has his kids stand in a line all shoulder to shoulder like the military. And when I get up back from the bathroom, I want everything in bags. You understand me? That's what I expect. There's a bag in the shop that says this bag helps animals. I'm a little disappointed in the cheetah, says a man, as the cheetah just walks back and forth, shitting. It's hard to see the animals, since people here act like paparazzi, crowding together at the edge of the cages, clicking cameras. People are curious. People want to see things where they usually are not. This curiosity puts animals in cages, or at least it helps to. Mom complains to child that she cannot see the panda. Arr! It's not there. It's inside, eating bamboo. What is bamboo? Bamboo is what pandas eat. Why is it called bamboo? Mom doesn't answer. I'm sad because the birdhouse isn't open. The animals I'm curious about are, that are trapped for me aren't available to me now. They're renovating. There's too many people inside seeing the panda, so I wait. I wait in line to see the panda, this panda who's famous for being a panda. Panda looks like rag passed out, covered in grease and bile. Oh, look, it's so cute, so comfortable. Brown, clumpy, mushed up shit on the floor in the corner. Dusty pipes hang from the ceiling. No mountains for Panda to explore, but paintings of mountains on the walls and paintings of mist. In the elephant house, a little girl says, ooh, stinky poo poo, and she's right. It feels like I'm drowning in shit. It feels like shit is scraping my insides. It feels like my insides are trying to escape. I see the sadness after a forced smile and the selfie like a body deflating. The inside of the elephant house looks like a gymnasium in an underfunded inner city school. I step on a flat dead rat as I leave. Hooters. Um, Hooters in Fairfax, Virginia, near where I grew up. Um, Men beating the shit out of each other on the TV set above me. Bacon wrapped wings. Yeah, you heard that right. The world's best wings wrapped in the world's best meat. Where's the tits as a teenage girl? She is surrounded by teenage boys. I want the tits to bring us some food. She says, I'm fucking hungry. It's so bright here, light bounces off plastic glaze on tables, on grease, on food, undertone of fried smell. It's so stereotypical here. Is it even interesting? Waitresses in tight shirts and booty shorts, all folks here in TV glow. Posters of women in bikinis in front of sports cars. Sign that says, please don't touch the wildlife. And posters of dad jokes like, if Hooters delivered, would they be called knockers? I feel like the waitresses here mostly huddle by the door, which is probably what I'd do if I were in their position. Woman and guy on a date, it seems. He chews loudly while wearing loud facial expressions. I was laughing pretty hard, even though it was my joke, but really he got the joke even better than me. He was laughing too. It was a really funny joke. <laughs> Cheese sauce for the curly fries here looks like styrofoam and almost tastes like nothing. It's pretty good, I guess. A woman walks in with two guy friends. She smiles. She shakes her head. Hey, wait a minute now. This is too much. No fair. Now there's two of them here, says a greasy-haired middle-aged man thirstily pointing at the two waitresses, jabbing his pointer finger right in front of them. Then other guys start talking in Spanish and a waitress, uh, to a waitress, but that doesn't go well. Yeah, sorry, she says. I know very poquito Spanish. Um, I'm going to read a little bit more poetry from uh, a poem that I wrote last year, just, just a little bit, um, and it's called um, um, A Squirrel in the Sea After Emily. Terrified clown, terrified clown, dip darting on witness, smeared makeup, a busted up face or comedic from tears in the atmosphere, the awkward dress, jealous of the flower, drinking rain eating sun that the squirrel fears always shaking like the clown, not death. The same who made the fire is the same who made dancing is the same who made the pigeon. If I owned me, I would too be. Love's responsibility to the pigeon, love's responsibility to dancing, love's responsibility to fire. If I owned me, I would too be. 
I just want to say this poem is about me. This little section is about me being jealous of a squirrel because they can jump a lot of places in the forest and I can only be in one place. Just to clear that up, okay? <laughs> green, green, yellow, yellow, fate pink flora that embowers and powers the twirling squirrel dashing, maybe dancing from branch to branch as if the world a bridge or an endless path, multifarious directions, options through a bright, almost fluorescent green and glorious chaotic cathedral. Oh, to be so small, all the levels of the forest available, but just a bit for me. Heaven isn't firm, nor is truth, nor is love firm without an opposite. Stones aren't themselves, aren't firm like raindrops or water. Stones are broken stones, but no raindrops are broken because they're not firm. To knock on hearts is not to stop being haunted by mirrors, but to dream in the streets is to stop the king's meaning for a moment. To transform streets into dreams will make the king not mean a thing if we can undream landlords. Clown spastic laughter borders anguish, thirst, and crying tears fit inside fissures as they aren't frozen. Borders fissures always let light through into the dark room, swallowing death as potential. Fissures dismantle definition. Definition should be a guide, not a prison. Guides aren't angels, and angels are messengers. It's no fun sitting down to nothing while the world screech at you and audible the cotton muffles, pain muffles, sweet nothings to a fountain of screams impossible to single out just one for you. But till you go close to a scream, you can't true it. Who can true a truth when they've got toes upon a precipice? No one while so precarious. Truth isn't flimsy, isn't anything to stand on. It's not firm either. It's like silly putty. To go even when go is slow, to go and not to know, but not to stop or speed up or try to know how or what or why slow, but just to know slow when go is slow and to know slow's unknown, but still to go. Um, okay, that's it, thanks so much. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Um, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Uh, there's a suggested donation for attendees of $5. Segway is one of the rare reading series that uh, pays its performers. Um, so please consider uh, donating. It goes directly to the readers. The information is gonna be put up on the screen and uh, we'll see everybody in 10 minutes. Hey everybody. Um, that was the, <laughs> I hate, I fucking hate tech stuff. Um, that was the, uh, that was the music that we selected for Halloween. Um, so you got a, a little Halloween intermission early. <laughs> I had picked, um, Fast Car by Tracy Chapman. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, we're gonna get started pretty soon. Thanks for bearing with us. So our next reader and our final reader is uh, Juby Ariola Headley. Headley, sorry. Um, his debut poetry collection, Original Kink, is the newest title from Sibling Rivalry Press. In his immersive and heartfelt lines, Ariola, Ariola Headley reaches back through a painful tangle of history to grab the genesis of desire and original kink, as in plucking the forbidden apple, or maybe it was a mango from the tree and sharing its juices, the spark from which complex systems of hunger have grown. It is a reckoning with lineage and the marks and scars left upon us by our parents and other entrenched forces. It is about the thirst for belonging but also the carnality that beckons us from the safety of our childhood bedrooms, which threatens to see us cast out into the wilderness by those we depend upon most. Ariola Headley decided, quote, I need to write about what my father did to me, end quote. And this book was born from the poet's decades of wrestling with his dad's and his own internalized homophobia. His father, having died when he was in college, casts a long shadow over his life, which he now seeks to synthesize into art, to reify and control the pain and bring it back to the well of love. 
Ariola Headley has said, quote, this is a book about learning how to be kind, how to be the kind of person you want to be, end quote, which can be a harrowing experience, but ultimately necessary. The poet is interrogating received masculinity and unmaking it to make my own masculinity. This is like working out how you have to tear apart the muscle for it to grow back together stronger. In these poems, the body is sacred and in danger, two states which Ariola Headley holds in electric tension. This is verse teeming with daring that drips with a lovely viscerality. It is defiantly bruised as the poet asserts, quote, the blood keeps sewering through my veins like rats in New York, invincible. This is a book of meaningful glances and defining moments, delicious pauses and bold asservations. In the poem, First Time, the speaker tells of losing his virginity, a story complicated exponentially by each clarifying stanza, starting with that flush and rush of blood suggesting tumescence, which soon enough spills out of tiny fissures and turns into a sudden bleeding, 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 that must be wiped up with wads of tissue, ending with the speaker tumbling away home, ruminating over what just happened to and with his body, feeling like a man for the first time, and finally, quote, feeling older than 14, end quote. As Ariola Headley has said, quote, I'm always trying to get to something that is deeper than I want to share, because if I'm not doing that, it never sings, end quote. Indeed, his fiercely intimate disclosures cohere into a wistful yet pointed musicality. When he writes the following, he is not only talking about his Bajan parents immigrating to America, but his own progress into manhood and the violence of escaping the past to become yourself. Quote, why does every diaspora require a shattering of who we used to be? End quote. In this world, grace and fury intermingle until they become the same thing. Quote, what I want is to forgive myself my history, which is another way to say, I want to set fire to the gospels. End quote. This is a poet unafraid to challenge himself and to challenge America. I love, I dare to love me. I dare you to love me like it's legal. Always a voracious reader, Ariola Headley started writing seriously in his early 40s after feeling the strong impulse to create a book about his father. Instead of prose memoir, he felt driven to make poems and pursued an education in the form through attending workshops, classes, retreats, an MFA program, and applying for fellowships. He said, quote, I tamped it down for years because I thought the world was telling me I should not write. And then it got relentless and would not let me go. And I threw myself in and probably had the right combination of drive and luck, end quote. He was a 2018 Penn America Emerging Voices Fellow and has been involved with the Vona Voices and Lambda Literary Writing Communities. He's joining us from Miami, where he lives with his husband, and until just a few days ago, his Guatemalan in-laws, who quarantined with them for seven months. Please welcome Juby Ariola Headley. Wow, thank you. I feel like saying we're done because I'm not possibly able to live up to the way you described my work. It's a new feeling now that I um now that I have a, a book out there. I. I'm not used to people discussing my work outside of workshop um, in that way. So, wow, <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you, Zach. I feel like you provided us with, I, I feel like that could be a movie and, or a play. I feel like that's, that's multi-genre, that's multi-discipline. Scenes from late capitalism or the fall of the American empire. And it's, it's kind of fascinating. And I love how you use humor. Do respect, I get what you were saying about the 9-11 poem, so I think people will too. And, and I feel, feel like there's humor fused throughout, and I, I really appreciate that, because humor is not done well in so much poetry, and it's hard to do, for me at least, so, and you do it so well, so thank you for all of that, because it's necessary. Um, I'm gonna start with a longer poem, and a poem I haven't read before, because 
one of the wonderful benefits of getting a little more time um, at the podium, so to speak, is that you can do a longer poem and take a risk with a poem you've never done before or read out loud before. And this is from Original Kink Collection that Lonely so beautifully described. Um, and this poem is called, Every God is a Slowly Dying Son. And it's dedicated to Craig G. Harris. When he entered any room, he became its source of light and heat. And I would thirst for these gifts and of course, swallow all that I could take until it felt as if I might be drowned. And in the end, I would be transformed because what are light and heat after all, but energy? And what is energy, but the potential for change? How could I do but love him? I loved him like a God, I did. And like humans let gods do, I let him fill me every way he wanted. Every God is a slowly dying sun. We being human, believe them infinite because we cannot perceive their rate of decay, not until the end when their light fades and their roar of fire thins to a bastard ember, struggling to retain its once glory in a bed of snuffed coals, what we call a galaxy. There are far more dead stars than live ones. Their carcasses populate the inky between. The Christian's God thought this an essential enough lesson for his flock to learn that he sent his son, scripted him to die ghastly, driving home these points both literal and figurative with a crown of thorns and a trio of nails. He could not have been more graphic, but humans, being human, see only what we can hold. We fetish his piercings and his blood, swaddle ourselves in some notion of savior, but death, is coming and when it comes, we will smell it on our God, like fear or shit or shame. He came to be with me the night before he died. In this construction, let the night before signify not the minutes and months before he physically died, but the moment he was dead to me. But there in the thick of his inescapable hurt, his immeasurable need. I could smell the shit on him and I being human, which is to say the villain in the story, I denied him, afraid of being bitten by the bug that was devouring him. The greatest villain in the Bible, a book lousy with them, isn't Lucifer or Judas, it's Peter. Jesus withstood 30 days of Lucifer's taunts and an eternity of his inferiority complex. No sweat. Judas' kiss didn't brand Jesus, merely marked him momentarily. But Peter, Peter who Jesus loved most of all, loved best of all of them, hear me tell it, Peter denied Jesus once, twice, three times in front of everyone. Just denial hurt less when there's no one to bear witness or more. That poem is at kind of at the midpoint of the book and it's a poem that was difficult for me to write. In some ways, I, it might've been the most difficult to write because it's a 30 year mea culpa or it's a mea culpa that took me 30 years to write to somebody that was very important to me at a certain point in my life. Um, and I feel like that's part of the project of the book, which is to interrogate the ways I have practiced or performed masculinity throughout the years. Society kind tries to, especially as a black man, render us thug and predator and criminal. And sometimes in the fear of being vulnerable because vulnerability might mean death, we shut off certain avenues of expression, of, of softness that I think we need to not shut off. Um, and so that's what that poem's trying to do. I'll do a lot of talking, but I'll try to read more poeming than I do talking. <laughs> 
Um, so I'd like to read next the first poem in the book, which somebody read and said, this is kind of the thesis statement of the book. And I get what they mean, and maybe you will too. And this poem is called Peacocking. You a boy, right? It's this silly game I play with myself, scavenging for scraps of conversation out of context, like peacocks in the Arctic, or tenderness expressed in baritone. And here in this department store, like every other, I'd found it, a single word, sharp and swift to Fisher, boy. Perhaps the boy had stared too long at the man behind the cosmetics counter. Gothic arches penciled in where eyebrows once grew. Perhaps the boy had lingered, longing, lusting, fingered the fabric of some skirt or blouse as the man I can't imagine is his father, rushed him through the missus section. This boy, broken his stride, his spirit, while some woman I can only imagine the boy called mother guided her gaze toward anywhere but this moment. She's long seated hope for something soft in the boy. I wish I didn't know the rest of his story, how butterflies won't so much settle in a boy's belly as slit their own throats for fear of flamboyance how a boy must fashion his fists into ciphers for touch. How quick we are to teach a boy to cradle his hurt in his hands and preen. So that's the opening poem to the book. I feel like for some reason today, I want to jump since I was talking about butterflies, to do another poem that talked about butterflies in a very different way. Um, and this poem is near the end of the book, and it's called Invitation. And I'll just tell you, this poem was born because I was sitting outside my house. I sit outside in the morning and drink my coffee, and I live in South Florida, where the weather is most days amenable to that. So I was sitting outside, and this particular week, it felt like every morning around the same time, a butterfly, a monarch butterfly would fly past me. And I don't have any particular um, monarch butterfly attracting foliage in my yard. So I felt like it was performing for me. And I thought, this butterfly is trying to flirt with me. It needs me to notice it. And that was the beginning of this poem. So this poem is called Invitation. Consider the sunset, its brazen catwalk dripping in papaya, pitaya, persimmon, flaunting, clearly wanting it bad. Kill Auburn monarchs, unashamed, a flame fluttering about this twisted fauna at play among the beasts and creatures of our jaded age, the smoke bellies and the choke lungs and the eye sores. Peep the bees, those glass-winged kings of industry, thirsting for blooms that sprout among the crabgrass, whipping that sweet nectar into one sticky gift. Wiggle wanton toes in sand, glimmering silicon sloughing history from your beat feet. Drink moonlight off the wine-dark sea or burnished bronze skin in the thick pritch of pre-dawn. Don't sleep, you'll miss the guild, the yearn. This world, a twirl, just lusting for your gaze. The other reason I wanted to read that one was because Zach read a poem about the Washington DC Zoo, which made me think about nature. And I've been to that zoo. And I think your poem captures a little bit of it. Um, I also have huge issues with zoos, but so do many folks in the world, that's not new. I just thought I would say it. Um, I think one of the poems you alluded to, Lonely, in your introduction was a short poem I wrote called Big Apple. And poems are born in odd ways sometimes. Um, sometimes 
I feel a need to write them and they come to me and I have a line and I build from there. And then sometimes they're built from prompts. And one day a workshop leader I had said, write an eight line poem with no more than eight syllables per line. And for whatever reason, this is what came out. And this poem is called Big Apple. I once ran two blocks down Christopher Street wearing white socks, a watch my grandfather would have hated. Men wear watches for function, not fancy, you'd have said, and nothing else. Lured out of my clothes and all shame by bourbon and some talker whose myth ran the length of his thigh. My pride survived. I wiped the night off me, wondered whether Eve too felt the wind prickle her skin and first reach for the serpent, hands open, wanting. Sometimes you like some of your poems better than others, and I'm not sure you ever should, but um, that one I like a little bit. Um, I thought maybe I would read another poem that you alluded to, Lonely, which was First Time. And that doesn't really need description, right? Y'all can figure out my first time doing what. It is not my first time accessing the internet, shall we say. Um, so this poem's called First Time. That flush and rush of blood, the moment I knew I had him, the moment he knew he had me, wanting it to be water into wine, bearing his weight on my back, that welcome yoke, waiting, waiting, waiting. Insistent breach of barrier, the smells spit and shit in Old Spice, tiny fissures, fires that no one warmed would come, wanting to stop, but I wanted this. I asked for this, wanting it to be done, wiping away my sins with wads of tissue tossed my way. Bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. Fisting our filth in my palm, hiding it from him, hauling my heart down that haunted hallway, flushing the memory as if it was not my legacy. Wanting to escape, whispering goodbye, walking home, washing away the stench, but not the soreness, rewriting the story to tell my enemies, thinking lie, cast him younger, cast him masterpiece, cast him woman. Knowing I had won, knowing I was first of us, knowing I became a man that day. Feeling older than 14. So yeah, that's my first time experience. Um, I don't wanna keep you too long. I will tell you my first time experience um, was with my mother's hairdresser. Is that not fascinating? He lived around the corner from us and I had never noticed him. And then one summer I hit puberty and he noticed me and the rest, as they say, is history. My mother doesn't know this story. So if you ever meet her, please don't tell her. I am pretty sure my mother is not gonna be reading my poetry too in depth. And I hope she doesn't read that and figure out who it is. And this is our secret, keep it to yourselves. Um, I think I will close out with one more long poem and that will be it for me. And this poem is in a sense, the poem, the collection hinges on, it's where it, it started conceptually for me. Um, and this poem is called Daddy. I decided that with all due respect to Sylvia Plath, I was also gonna use that title. Um, it's not structured in the same way. I don't know if it does the same thing, y'all will tell me someday. But um, this poem is called Daddy. And so I'm going to close out with this. Daddy. Christmas, 1974. 
Daddy sporting his new Christmas swag, grinning so wide his tar-stained gums are showing, and grinning with his eyes, too. So raw how he lets it hang out, this hunger for what the world wants to take from him, almost an aching. The woman who loved him enough to make this moment sees his need, too, and feeds it, even though everyone knows. You get too close to the beast. He's going to bite every time, every goddamn time. And look at that young boy perched by his lap, maybe six or seven. Too old for a knee straddle, I'd say, but there he is. His own grin limited only by the stretch of his skin. He's true. He looks close to nothing like his daddy. If you focus on the usual lips and ears and chins and childhoods, it's the boy's eyes. The joy that dances there, a carbon copy of his father's. I'd like to meet that blissed out boy. Fourth of July, 1976. Along this stretch of summer we ride, our car, a solid slice of Americana, with its vinyl top and body slather than that sturdy shade of green reserved for hunters. On the dash, a, still, a silver sticker pinpoints time and taste. Gas, grass, or ass, nobody rides for free. The front seat, a single bench. Each torque and twist of highway sends me crashing into daddy. A mimeograph of tenderness. 1,000 spans of silence yawn before us, broken only by the screams of passing tires. Suddenly, some sports car slides in front of us, as if we belonged behind it. In the slivers of seconds between life and impact, Daddy hurls his arm across my chest, pins me to the seat, arm hairs prickling my chin. My savior. An extended blast of profanity, an exaggerated thrust of his middle finger in that moment, like that sports car, has passed. Just this quick, I lose my chance to say, I love you too, Daddy. Thanksgiving, 1979. Daddy hauls me along to the dog track. I press my face against the glass in the bedding lobby. Look at all those hungry dogs chasing something frail and furry, suspended from what looks to be a fishing pole. I wonder why anyone thinks this is fair. I look for comfort in fistfuls of sugary meant to buy my silence. It's never enough, though. I still want to break Daddy's winning streak. I still want to go home. I still want Daddy to look at me like he does those dogs. Like I could win. Labor Day, 1982. Queen Tony's all swish and swagger. He hangs around daddy's neck like an ornament at the weekly Saturday domino games and jeans. He must have needed Vaseline to slide on, but bulging like ripe melons, just begging you to bite into them. And always Queen Tony sports an angry red fishnet top that covers him only in spirit. Queen Tony's nipples fight their way past those slivers. They look like raisins daring you to flick one into your mouth. Daddy sits Queen Tony on his lap, winks at the guys, and says, my good luck charm. Then Daddy holds the dominoes up to Queen Tony's swelling lips to blow, and Queen Tony always does as he's told. Then Daddy makes some joke about blowjobs, and all the men laugh, no matter how much they've tried not to hear it. Daddy's other hand planted firm at the base of Queen Tony's spine. It all feels such a gorgeous blasphemy, such a delicious sin. And oh, how I wish I could be queen so any man would touch me like that. Even Daddy. Memorial Day, 1987. Graduation's fast approaching. The slick suit daddy buys me won't spare him from my silence. I can't get far enough gone. I got something to tell you, he says. 
nursing on a British brand of cigarette as if he could class up the habit. I have cancer. Is it curable? I want to know. Yeah, he says. You know me, I'm a warrior, baby. And takes another long drag off his undoing. I wonder whether this is irony. And one more thing before you leave me, he says. I love you. And that's how I know he's dying. September 26th, 1987. What does it mean to forsake a body, to render it unto mud, to commit it to compost? Daddy looks a fiction of his former self. The chocolate sloughed off his skin, and now he's some version of leaden. He's ill-prepared for the afterlife, I think. I can see the tiny white stitches meant to hold his lips together as if someone needed to be sure he wouldn't interrupt his wake by speaking. I place my hand on his chest as if for the first time, which is to say, for the first time, and feel the wadded and folded plastic patting his chest to its former fullness. The knot on kinks that lived in the hollows of me. I name this moment ceasefire. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I really appreciate y'all. Thank you, Juby. This is uh, this is the book Original Kink, uh, out now from Sibling Rival Repress. And uh, now we're going to allow the audience to be heard, um, so that everybody can give a resounding. Um, round of applause to Zach Haber and Juby Ariola Headley. Um, let's see, as we're, we're just adding people right now. Hold on. Oh my Lord, all these people. Yes. Okay, everybody, we, I think we can hear you. Um, let's give a big round of applause. Thank you, Thank you all for, for coming. And uh, hope to see you next week. The Segway reading series continues on Zoom. Uh, who do we have next week? Uh, Ted Reese and Robert Gluck. And uh, if you want to hang around and, and chat for a minute, that's fine. But the reading's over. <laughs>